great to be here tonight and see all these familiar faces out there. Um, and just to show what a small world it is, I just met the man who lives in my old apartment who's been getting my mail. And so <laughs> he's at UCSF and lives at Nakamura. Sorry, I found a way to get it to you. That's well, now you. Know. <laughs> It is such a small world. Uh, as Pranay said, I'm Hallie. I'm with Rock Health. Um, if you don't know about Rock Health, I'm going to talk a little bit about our pre in this presentation. Um, it's not going to be nearly as long as the FDA presentation. We'll get you guys out of here so you can have dinner and go to bed. Um, so before we started, um, before we start, I'd like to know a little bit more about the audience. Um, how many entrepreneurs do we have? So mostly entrepreneurs. And how early are people pre-funding? Mostly pre-funding. Okay. Um, and how many have a technical background? Healthcare background? Wow, it's about 50-50. Good mix. All right, let's get started. Um, so this is what my friends, particularly my friends in technology, think about healthcare. Uh, they think it's stodgy and it's boring. It's overly complex and regulated. Um, there's a lot of FDA. Um, white walls, um, pretty intimidating and not necessarily an attractive market for someone who can build a game or a social network and build a product pretty quickly, get it to market, and make some money. So we started this, um, a movement and community that proves that healthcare can be fun and being a healthcare entrepreneur can be not just fun but also rewarding uh, and not just because you get to hang out with people like this, although we are pretty fun. So what is Rock Health? Um, I saw a Rock Health entrepreneur in the audience, Michael. And do you mind standing up and just saying what Rock Health is? Hi. Um, <coughs> Rock Health is awesome. Rock Health is, um, well, it's, a, it's an accelerator. And you get uh, money, space, connections, and you get Hallie to guide you the whole way to funding and... If you like it or not. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, so Rock Health is a five-month program for entrepreneurs in San Francisco. We're just down the street here. Um, and in, in addition to funding, we provide mentorship, workshops. We have tons of great connections in the space from our sponsors, which include payers like United Healthcare, to providers like UCSF and Mayo Clinic, and really try to accelerate the chances of a startup succeeding by giving them all the partners and knowledge and access that they need in those very crucial early stages. So um, today they told me to talk about tips for entrepreneurs running and driving this digital health revolution. So I thought we would talk about two or three things that I hear the most about um, from startups in our office, which is fundraising and partnerships. So why don't we start with funding? So here's the good news. It's a very, very good time to be a digital health entrepreneur in this, um, in this economy and in this space. So this is actually, um, the blue marks the percentage of deals um, that are in digital health. So there's an unprecedented number of deals. And the green is actually the percentage of VC funding. So not only are we seeing the bigger volume of deals, but we're also obviously seeing more money flow into this space. And more good news is that it's happening right here in California and in San Francisco. And if I have anything to do with it, it's going to stay here. And the digital revolution is going to be part of the San Francisco culture. Thank you. Yes. So it's really, I mean, that's why it's great to be here and to, to be part of these sort of groups. Because we really have all of the great assets in San Francisco that really lay the groundwork for being the leader. We have great hospital systems. We have great entrepreneurs and technology and access and a culture of innovation. and risk aversion and people that are willing to be crazy and think really big ideas. So we're really excited that it's happening here and most of the funding is happening here. Um, one of the funding me mechanisms, which is probably the most popular, uh, would be VC funding. Most of you are probably too early for VC funding, but it is a good idea to really understand who the active VCs are in the space so you can start building relationships with them now. Um, the good news is that this space kind of straddles between life science VCs and technology VCs. The bad news is that it's between life science VCs and tech VCs. And there aren't a lot of people that really understand digital health. And there aren't a lot of good cases for them to see what success looks like. So what I've noticed with the entrepreneurs that we work with is that, are there any VCs in the room before I say this? Okay. Um, that VCs are wasting a lot of time from entrepreneurs. They're using entrepreneurs as a way to learn about the space. 
which is good because hopefully they'll be able to gain enough knowledge to feel confident about making bets, but they're also wasting people's time because they might uh, get you to the point where they think you're going to invest, you're going to give them a lot of numbers, a lot of insight, and they end up not investing. And I see this happening to so many entrepreneurs, and it totally bums them out. And I try to tell them it's not you, it's that the VC is just trying to learn. Um, so take advantage of the free lunch. Don't give them too many details of what you're doing, um, but build that relationship because maybe when they are ready to invest, you'll already have that relationship established. Um, the other thing that we know about VCs is that funding in this space is, the majority of it is B2B, especially the large funding. So startups with enterprise facing applications are getting funded more than consumer. Uh, just curious here, how many people are working on B2B? B to D, which is tools for doctors and clinicians, and consumer. Wow, so consumer is actually a minority in here. Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of the traditional business models more easily replicated in enterprise products. Whereas consumers, you guys have all heard this, that people don't think consumers pay for health. We know this is changing. We know it's changing quickly, especially with some of the startups here in our backyard, like Fitbit and Jawbone. Um, but it's still a little bit slow, and VCs are waiting until they have one big hit till they're confident. This is a list of some um, VCs that I know have made investments in the space, and I would recommend if you are looking for VC funding to take a look at these guys, reach out to them, cold email them. Um, they're all very interested in the space, and most of them have done more than one deals. And some of them are more VC, some of them, we have two that are um, actually corporate VCs. And then we have angels. So um, kind of like VCs, there aren't a lot of angels that really get this space. This is the one most prolific uh, angel. Everybody know who this is? Esther, Esther, Esther Dyson, yay. So not only has she done like a dozen deals, but she's really the only angel that I know of that's done more than two in this space. Um, she's really hard to get a meeting with. She's on the other coast, but um, if you can get in touch with her and just share your idea with her, she's really wonderful and has a really good idea of, of what works in the space. There are a couple of angel groups that we're familiar with. One is Health Tech Capital, Band of Angels, and Life Science Angels, and most of them um, have websites where you can apply with your ideas online, and they review them. Sometimes they have a dinner. Sometimes they charge you for dinner. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, so, so don't go to anyone that charges you for dinner. Um, they should be taking you to dinner. And, uh, and, and that's actually, uh, angels are a great way to especially get to that next step if you're looking to just have enough funding to get trials up and running or build your prototype out, etc. And then there are foundations. So I'm going to talk about foundations for a little bit and then some non-dilutive government funding. Because I think these are the two pieces that I don't hear entrepreneurs talking a lot about. But these are two um, very well-funded groups that have lots of money that are interested in healthcare. If you guys know it or not, you are all leading social enterprises. You're all trying to create value in the healthcare system, reduce inefficiencies, reduce costs, improve outcomes, improve access to care. And that's exactly what these groups are doing as well. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they focus on um, startups that are focusing on international applications, so they don't really do domestic health, but if your product is useful in a global context, they'd be great to reach out to. They did over 700 deals at 100K. Um, and this is grants, and mostly grants. Some of them are investments, but mostly grants. So you don't have to pay it back. You don't have to give up any of your company. It's really a great deal. They actually um, gave money to one of our startups last year called Cellscope. The California Healthcare Foundation is another one. They actually invested in Rock Health as well. They have a $10 million innovation fund, and they're looking for startups with the potential to impact 100,000 Californians or deliver $25 million in savings in the system. Um, they also have just a really great focus on innovation, and they have one person whose whole job is to go out there and, and meet startups, so they're a great one to get in touch with. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, focuses on healthcare access and are really looking to give grants to groups that are having trouble finding traditional venture funding. They funded one of our groups last year called Chronology, which is a social network for Crohn's patients. And they thought, well, this is something that a VC might, might not be attractive to a VC because it's a particular patient population, but it's actually a very meaningful product that has the opportunity to really change lives. So they invested in them. And the School Foundation, I don't know as much about them, but I've heard great things that they really are um, excited about focus focusing on entrepreneurs working on healthcare access in the developing world. And from what I understand, they actually give grants to the entrepreneur and not necessarily the company. So you, you can have a little bit of freedom to research if you're very early on. And then non-dilutive funding. 
So this is actually something that is uh, I learned of recently, and we had some people come in from SBR to talk about these grants. If you are from um, the medical side, you probably know a ton about these sort of grants, especially from the NIH. Um, so from what I understand, there, I mean, there's millions and millions of dollars out there that's for startups in the research phase. Um, and when, when they came in to talk to us, they were like, oh, but it's really competitive. About 20% of people get it. Only 20% of people get it, which was a joke to us because only 3% of people get into rock health. So we were like, okay, well, so the bar, it's a little bit interesting what they, uh, what they think of as, as challenging. I think really the challenging part is that it's about nine months to apply, so you have to be patient. Um, and obviously your idea is going to change dramatically in nine months. Um, but the SBIR grants can um, fund startups for millions of dollars. So they have different stages, and so it's definitely worth looking into. Okay, any funding questions? Awesome. Yes? we found was interesting is that they're um, like ex small amounts of money from challenges or from rock health is is pretty easy to come ar ar around um, and large amounts of money if you're raising ten million dollars it's not easy but um, there are people that are willing to write big checks there's fewer people kind of in this middle ground if you're looking for like 500k it's a lot harder um, and I think a big piece of that is that there aren't a lot of angels comfortable in the space and there aren't enough VCs that are willing to make small checks so it's an interesting um, misalignment because we all need just a little bit to get to that next step, but there are very few people ready to fund that that transition. Yeah. Uh, so I actually see this issue in terms of things like ROI trials and that kind of thing. So have you any thoughts on, I, mean, I think that's a huge gap and it would be interesting to see if there's a way to build some sort of ecosystem or, yeah. or work together in terms of figuring out how to solve that gap. Because if you don't figure out how to get some trials going, we're never going to prove our ROI. Yeah. So we've worked with a couple of different groups um, to do this. So, so Mayo Clinic's been great. They've actually invested in a couple of our startups, and most of the funding ends up going back to them. So it goes back to, to their resources to actually put on the trial. Um, but, but seeing the hospitals and providers actually get in there and say, look, we want to do this trial, and we know that we have to support you because you can't you know, live off ramen forever. Um, and I think UCSF is actually exploring how they can streamline a process that um, we have one team that actually does have a grant that they co-authored with um, a PI from UCSF. And so they were able to apply for the grant together, and the developer got you know a little bit, maybe thirty percent of the money to do the trial, and the hospital ends up with the majority of it. Um, but you know I think that's right because if you can't get the trial off the ground, you can't prove efficacy. How do you raise money? It's a chicken egg problem. It's really unfortunate. All right. So let's talk about partnerships. I don't think um, I can think of a startup that has become successful in the space without having a number of strategic partners. And depending on what you're doing, you're going to be needing to develop relationships with employers, with payers, with providers, with small practices, with nonprofits, with patient groups. Um, I tried to think of all of them when I was working on this late last night. Uh, I probably missed some, but uh, the idea is that there are a lot of people that you're going to meet in the space going to these meetups. And you're going to have to filter out those that sound interesting and are nice people um, with those that actually can, their organizations can back and support a relationship that is strategic and gets you in the right direction. And I think there's a lot of um, smoke and mirrors in, in some relationships because there are groups that are, um, you know, vocal about meeting startups but haven't really proven that they will take the risk to work with startups. And so um, really diving into these conversations and understanding their capacity because sometimes it's not even their fault it's that they don't have the system set up to partner with the startup so these are groups that I will vouch for that I have seen work with startups and I think are fantastic um, for the hospital side Mayo UCSF Stanford Sutter and Dignity Health um, which was Catholic Healthcare West have all worked with startups um, have had have heard great things from those startups that they've been um, very bad. I can put this online you guys don't have to take pictures of it um, and have been valuable not just in trials, uh, not just in product feedback, but I've seen uh, come up with interesting partnerships for distribution to patients. Um, 
Uh, some of the stuff, actually I forgot Harvard on here, but um, we work with Harvard Medical School and we have really interesting content deal with them. So their actual publishing team has uh, a mandate out there to get their content out to more people the way Mayo has. So they've been a great partner for us there. <clears throat> Some corporate partners that we've had really good experiences with are payers like United and Aetna. You guys have probably heard that Aetna um, acquired iTriage, right? Um, and United just uh, announced a partnership with Health Loop. Qualcomm does tremendous work now with their Qualcomm Life initiative that they launched in December. And uh, they've not only funded dozens of startups through their Qualcomm Life $100 million fund, but they also have a platform that they're looking to integrate closely with startups for distribution, which is great. Um, Best Buy, if you haven't heard, is actually starting an aisle for wellness, which is super cool. Um, another way to get in front of customers other than the Apple store. And they have pilots now, I think, in the Midwest in a couple of stores. But they're actually having Fitbits and winnings on the shelves. So another great partner for any of you guys that are building consumer products that are actual physical sensor products. Um, Walgreens as well and AT&T. Did I see a hand? Am I seeing things? Verizon. Yeah. Verizon? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So um, so here, here are some partners. I mean, there are dozens and dozens. Here are some that I've seen work with startups and have had really great feedback. Um, but how do you actually establish a partnership with these? So I was brainstorming kind of um, the, the formula. And I would say the first step is to find the right person. So go talk to startups that have established partnerships with these organizations and get the name of the person that they actually did the deal with. Uh, I think that spending time w with the wrong person is like you know chasing your tail and it's just not, not worth it. If they can't write you a check, like they're not the right person. Um, and maybe that means like anything short of stalking. LinkedIn, I think, is fair game. Uh, as long as you're not showing up on their doorstep. Finding the right person is, is critical. And then crafting the right pitch. So once you know who the person is and you understand their mandate within the company, you can figure out how your startup solves one of their problems. So you have to really craft this as, I'm solving, you have a need, you have a mandate within your company to figure out X amount of wellness products and my startup is the one. So coming up with that, crap, that pitch and really understanding how you fit together. And the last, the most important piece is Alec Baldwin. Always be closing. I think at the end of the day, it is just, it comes down to sales. Um, a lot of people kind of like squirm when they think of sales and pitching, but you have to get good at it. You have to become a salesperson. I don't know when I became one, but like ever since I've kind of owned it, my life has gotten so much easier. So, um, another another great sales pitch. This is Jay-Z quote. I'll let you read it. I'm not going to try to wrap it unless someone wants to. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if, if really if sales is something you're not comfortable with, I just have to say, like, get comfortable with it. Um, you are, as an entrepreneur, the face of your company. You're selling it. It's your baby. It's your love. Like, you're the best person to go out there and be the champion for it. So instead of hiring someone with a dozen years of experience in sales that's going to try to use some formula, just use your own passion. I think that's the best way to do it. All right, so um, resources. Um, okay, so how many people in here have a medical background? I don't. <laughs> um, how many people have a technical background? Marketing? Um, design? Okay, look around. You guys are each other's resources. I and mean, this is it. This is San Francisco. This is where the digital health revolution is going to happen. And I think we really have to start thinking of each other as resources. So we're all working in this space. It's really important what we're all doing. And so thinking of each other and these sort of communities and these meetups as an opportunity to get help and share your, your expertise and also lend a hand and get some help as well, I think is really important. Um, other than that, you can go to the Rock Health website, rockhealth.com slash resources. And um, wanted to make a quick little announcement too. We are um, very shortly launching this open source curriculum called Startup Elements, where all of the workshops that we do at Rock Health are going to be um, we got a grant from the Kauffman Foundation to record and edit them into beautiful productions so that they can be open source and every entrepreneur in digital health can enjoy them. And our workshops range from talks on the FDA um, to marketing and HIPAA, everything. So that's going to be you know, another resource for all of you and that's one of our commitments as Rock Health is to support as many entrepreneurs as possible. And 
other than each other, you can check out the resources that we have. So I'll leave with one more of my favorite quotes. And then we can have a few minutes of Q&A. I mean, speaking of my toes here, um, you know, we're, Rock Health is a nonprofit, and our, our mission and our mandate is actually an educational one, and it's to support and promote entrepreneurship and digital health. The incubator is one way we do it, and it takes up a lot of our capacity and a lot of our resources. So groups like this that we can support is actually a great way for us to expand our reach, um, especially because it already has organizers and it has infrastructure, so however we can help is is fantastic, even if it's just showing up and, and chatting and sharing our resources and knowledge. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually answered this question on Cora recently. Oh, well, I answered it, and you thanked me then. Um, but I, I guess to share with everyone else. Um, so, so previously, um, before Rock Health, I was actually a business student where I kind of crafted this idea. Before that, I actually founded another organization in the health space called Yoga Bear, um, which you still get my mail for. Um, and it's, a, it's an organization that provides yoga to cancer patients, um, and we work with hospitals and yoga studios, etc. And we actually started, uh, we work with about five hospitals, and literally the way I, I approached the hospitals and the partnerships um, was to, to find the right person, so to find someone in integrative medicine and oncology. Uh, and I cold emailed them and I you know, said, well, can I come to one of your events? They already had kind of their own um, community events that they put on and talked to them there. And it really was just finding the right person, going and talking to them, um, communicating the value of working with me, and then um, really building trust over time. I mean, it's, hospitals are so slow. Um, so, so really, you have to be so patient with them. Um, but I think having building that trust and really being able to communicate your value is is key. Yeah. Like as a physician, I'd also like to add, you know, you could look at when they're having grand rounds and pick the specialty you want to focus on, and maybe look at the websites and see when they're having grand rounds. That would be a good way to access these doctors, even if yeah. just for five minutes you get FaceTime. There are obviously annual conferences and there are journals where you could yeah. look up and see who the key players are in your field of interest. Uh, those are some good ways to start. I mean, every like every every medical specialty has an association, and some of them have multiple ones you might want to look into. Yeah, that's actually interesting you say that because what I've learned about doctors is that, well, especially doctors at research institutions, is that their incentives are to publish. So you all of a sudden present them with an opportunity to do unique research that can help uh, propel them in their own field, and it's just a, a really great symbiotic relationship. Yes? Hi. Um, um, I think it would be useful for the group at some point, maybe this is something that Rock Health can do, is to actually explain the hospital cell cycle um, and how complicated it is and, and the appropriate times to approach budget-driven organizations like that and how consensus-driven they are and I think for entrepreneurs that are used to kind of shooting from the hip, yeah, it's just it's it's oil and water, and I I, I think you know yeah. I spend a lot of time counseling people like you know add a year to your your, your, your selling effort and, yeah. and then you won't be frustrated. Well, and one of the things that I always hear BCs say is that uh, just figure out a way to go around it, <laughs> like go around the system, don't don't go through it because it's just too complex and slow. Um, but I'm sure there are entrepreneurs here that have actually gotten their products into the hospital. And so, again, we should use this resource. And maybe, you know, in putting together future meetings, we can be able to leave more time for that sort of interaction. Um, something that we do in a women's group that I'm involved in is you have to go in asking for something and giving something. So you say, I'm going to give my, you know, I'll give half an hour telling someone how I sold to a hospital. What I want to get is some, half an hour of someone looking at my, my budget, someone that knows finance. Um, and then that way you can really match for, for needs and we can help each other more efficiently. So it might be an idea. <coughs> Sorry to propose ideas. Yeah. I was going to add that UCSF and Stanford Medical School actually have great opportunities for you to hang out there. They have online information from UCSF and you talk about bringing them out. So that's actually public. It's free online. You can go over the They get together on Friday afternoons at about 4 o'clock. Uh, they're mm -hmm. at, uh,
You should send that information to the group. They'll, then they'll, be, they'll be mad at you for sending 100 new people their way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Allie, in your list of uh, philanthropic uh, partners and, 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 and sources of funding, you mentioned the West Wireless Institute. Do you have any experience of them? Or? Yeah. Um, so West is a two-year-old institute down in San Diego, and they have a research arm, which is really just to promote wireless health, and they do research and build really cool prototypes, and the idea is to spin off spin out some of those, but they recently set up a fund. Um, they did invest in one of our mentors' companies, so I know that they are active in the space. Um, and uh, it's a small team, but I think it's a pretty well-funded fund, and all of the carry and all of the upside goes back to the nonprofit, so they definitely have more of a um, double bottom line outlook on, on what they invest. So you didn't mention it because you don't want this to happen in San Diego. They were on my. They were on my VC. Yeah. Oh, were they? On they were on my VC okay. one because they don't do grants. They do okay, investments. They investment. I tried to get them to give me a grant, and they didn't. So they don't get on my grant page. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So my question is similar to John's. Um, uh, there are incubators for profit, and there are incubators for not for even not for profit. Can you explain the business model a little bit? How you uh, bring you know VC funds and West Wireless or whoever you know. Uh, for Rock Health. Is, yeah. Can you oh talk yeah, about sure. Kind of business model, how you uh, yeah. This? yeah. So um, Rock Health is a nonprofit mainly so we can work closely with the hospital partners, and it was something that they requested early on in our relationship as we were building out the idea. We worked really closely with Mayo Clinic to help um, refine <laughs> what what a successful incubator would look like, and so um, in order to work closely with them and have the sort of agreements we have with them without paying them, it was best that it was a nonprofit. So the way that we're funded is through sponsorship fees and donations from our partners that range from um, VCs here in the Valley, NEA, Excel, MDV, Averdare, to corporate partners like Nike, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Genentech, United Health Group, Quest Diagnostics. Uh, I think we have like 15 funding partners. And they, uh, they write us donations for under 100K and kind of get Insight. I mean, they don't have any first right of refusal, but they get to hang out with us and come to our office and mentor the team. So there's definitely um, value for them to be involved. But I think they also enjoy kind of putting their name on a movement and um, feeling like they're giving back to the community. Yeah. Uh, what kind of trends do you see in terms of the interest and demand from your partners? Is it more in the clinical in the treatment development, or is it more in like the wellness side, or yeah. you know, making the healthcare cost more transparent, or do you see any things? So I would say that most of um, the investors that, that I've been working with are still in that um, <coughs> formula stage of creating their investment thesis, so they don't necessarily have like a stake in the ground and where they want to invest. Um, so they're, they're really trying to learn as much as possible and making bets along the way. Uh, some of the things that I hear a lot about, I mean, big data and healthcare, uh, obviously is huge. People, I, clinical tools are interesting. Uh, getting, you, taking advantage of meaningful use and ACOs is obviously really interesting to, to the VCs, um, but are still kind of uncertain until we hear a little bit more about the different stages of meaningful use. Um, sensors. I think that's huge. I think that's really cool too. Those are kind of some things. You, we actually have a report. If you go to slideshare.net and just look up Rock Health, we, we do a bunch of reports where we um, survey VCs and entrepreneurs and look at the investment and the breakdown of the investment so you can see some trends. Yeah. Um, can you talk about some of the entrepreneurs That's a really good question. Um, so not rock health entrepreneurs, just in general. Yeah, just digital health. Yeah. Um, so I think it's still really early, and uh, we're not we're starting to see early like acquisitions that are kind of an indicator that these startups are creating value and corporations want to buy them, which is great for our ecosystem. Um, and we're seeing a few IPOs like Hippocrates, which is another kind of measure for, for success, financial success, maybe. Um, Practice fusion. But, 
Yeah, Practice Fusion and ZocDoc are kind of the, you know, the great, let's use Practice Fusion because they're here in San Francisco, <laughs> but they're growing and, and filling a real need. Um, so some of the, yeah, I guess EMR is a kind of a space that's a little bit more mature for digital health. Yeah. Um, it sounds like Hello Withings, Health after today. Hello Health, yeah, with their online practice management tool. Um, I would say I would say Fitbit's a really great example, and Withings are great examples. I mean, they're physical products, so it's a little bit different because there's a business model there with the actual physical product. Um, but you know, Withings has like five or six products. They haven't taken the dime of funding since their first million dollar round, and they're in France. They're able to do so well, so um, there's definitely something there. Should we wrap it up? It's getting late. Questions? Yeah, sure. We should. Well, that's a, that's a hell of a challenge. You finish off with it. So it's a good time to end. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>